The collision of a large cargo ship with a bridge in Baltimore has several people concerned about potentially affected companies and industries. Additionally, we have seen the S&P on quite a tear and it's historic. We're going to talk about that and a couple other things today on Open Interest. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Mike Coe, and welcome to Open Mic, sponsored by Options Play. For those of you who tuned in on Monday, I'm sorry that I wasn't here live. Because I am here live today, I'm going to try to spend a little bit extra time taking questions and answering them, if possible. But in the meantime, I thought we might talk a little bit, of course, about the tragedy in Baltimore that looks to have claimed six lives, and that, of course, is the collision of that large uh, Singapore-flagged cargo ship uh, that impacted the bridge there, and uh, we have, I think, six missing bridge workers. Now, of course, this is really more of a conversation about stocks uh, more than anything else, so I think it makes some sense for us to contemplate um, what companies, what industries may have been affected. And this is a terminal that uh, has several industries that are in it. And I think we actually have a graphic that shows some of the businesses or industries that are actually affected within the port. And I apologize. I'm going to leave this on the screen for a little bit uh, here so you can get a better look at it. But basically, the idea here is you can see where the impact of the dolly with the bridge took place. Uh, anything that is to the upper left of that bridge is, of course, now trapped by um, the collapsed bridge. So that includes, I think, something like a dozen ships and numerous uh, other harbor vessels, including tugs and so on. But if you take a look at this, you know, highlighted in purple, you can see the respective uh, industries or businesses that, that are impacted um, by this. Uh, among the, those that are probably most well known include Carnival Cruise Lines. You can see that they have a, uh, a spot over there. Uh, also, one of the things that a lot of people have spoken about are the auto industries being affected by this. This is uh, two issues, really. Uh, one is for parts, uh, a lot of row rows, that's the roll on, roll off um, vehicle transport ships, and also parts going through the port. Although, I think what was interesting to me today, just in terms of price action, was that when you take a look at these, and we can look here first at, at Carnival, um, that actually it doesn't seem to be, the share price at least, doesn't seem to be impacted uh, at all by, by what's going on. And in fact, actually, the stock has actually been doing reasonably well of late. In fact, uh, I think the company just recently put out an 8K, among other things. And as a part of that, um, what they have actually spoken about is relatively positive. So uh, they also have some some issues in the Red Sea that are impacting them. But the net effect is that in terms of their financial condition, uh, they're talking about uh, record first quarter revenues and an all-time record booking levels. And so what we're looking at now as we go through this, we can see their historical performance. And obviously, Carnival, uh, much like a lot of other discretionary sort of travel-related businesses, was deeply affected during the pandemic. Um, it's a capital intensive business. And of course you have to maintain the ships and so on. So the company did take on a decent amount of debt, but as we can see here, uh, it looks like the company's actually beginning to bounce back. Um, and I think that's a positive. And I think we also happen to have uh, an EPS uh, table as well. And I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of time to think about this, but what we can see, although the growth rate that you're seeing, when you, you look at this, you might think to yourself, well, it looks like the growth rate is slowing, but I think it's really important to understand that as you're forecasting those future growth numbers, bear in mind that this is coming out of the pandemic. So the growth rates that you've seen in recent years are essentially coming off of zero, right? So we, these, these companies uh, were all but shut down. Uh, they were incurring a lot of debt essentially just to um, maintain. And now they're sort of getting back to uh, the regular course of business. Now, of course, they they are carrying in many cases a bit more debt than they have historically. Um, but I still think that this is actually one of the few areas where you're not actually looking 
at the companies at all-time highs, despite the fact that they are indicating that their bookings, in fact, are. Uh, we can actually just take a look over here. Um, I mean, obviously, if you happen to own the stock, uh, I'm the first thing I would say is, you know, don't sell it based on the port news. Um, you know, companies can have these kinds of setbacks, and I don't think that this one is going to be so material. And they have themselves said that the Red Sea issues that they are also facing are probably not going to be that material. We can take a look in options play here in a second if I can get this pulled up. I'm going to let that uh, simmer for a second, and we'll see what's going on. Why don't I, before I, I get to that, why don't we also talk a little bit about Ford Motor. Uh, Ford Motor Company, which I think we have some graphics for this one too. Another company that has talked about the potential disruptions related to uh, the port closure for some period of time. And um, here, I'm sort of less sanguine uh, about the company. This doesn't really have much to do actually with the port issue so much as the fact that I just think that it is a very difficult environment right now uh, for the automakers. First of all, you have significant disruption going on uh, with respect to uh, the shift in, in cars uh, from you know, internal combustion to electric. Ford has uh, obviously tried very hard to make inroads in this area, but so far I would argue somewhat unsuccessfully because they haven't really demonstrated that they can be profitable on the EV side. Combine that with the fact that it does also look like uh, even the best performing EV company in the space, which is Tesla, it, it also seems to be facing a few, a few headwinds there. Uh, just a personal anecdote on that front. Um, you know, we, we own Teslas. Uh, I, I had pre-ordered a Tesla Cybertruck and it seemed like kind of an interesting and fun thing at the time. Uh, as the delivery date approached, and many of the promises that had been made about the vehicle initially proved like they probably weren't going to be met. So I'll just give you some examples. When I first pre-ordered it, it was going to be 70,000. It was going to have a 500 mile range, um, all kinds of good stuff like that. Uh, when I was asked to put an incremental deposit down on it last year. So just to be clear, uh, pre-orders were accepted the day the thing was announced, which was many years ago. Uh, for those who were very short on the list, for on the reservation list for these vehicles, um, you had to put down a thousand dollar deposit uh, last year at some point. When they started doing the first deliveries, which took place in Austin, Texas, in November, many of many of us who had very early reservation numbers, uh, so I think those are the reservation numbers that started one one two. We were contacted by Tesla and told, "Look, you can have one of these things very quickly." Um, I was offered a two motor truck. I think it was late December, it was probably around late December, they said they could give me a two motor truck or I could wait. Uh, what they said at the time was gonna be eight to nine months to get the tri-motor version. Uh, the two motor version, which was not the one I had ordered, was now gonna be $100,000. Um, you had to buy full self-driving, but that wasn't going to be operational when you got it. I opted for the, for the tri-motor. Um, Figuring I was going to just be able to, you know, figure it out later. Uh, very shortly thereafter, I was going to say about six weeks later, I was contacted again by Tesla and told you can get the tri-motor uh, essentially as soon as you want it. Um, that was going to be $120,000 plus taxes and fees. All the rest of it was going to add up to a pretty big number. I think it was like $135,000 out the door. And what was fascinating to me about that was that uh, that was essentially double what I had in my head as a price for this thing. Again, you had to buy the full self-driving, but you weren't going to have it straight away. Uh, it was something they called the foundation edition, which best I could tell was a light bar and some laser etching, whatever. Um, and I just decided that, you know, based on the fact that our use as a family, uh, going skiing, whatever, driving up to the mountains, the reported range for people who had taken early delivery in moderately cold weather was that it was well less than 300 miles. So from where I live to the mountains, 210 miles, all uphill, and considerably colder than 40 degrees uh, in the winter time, it just didn't seem like that was going to work out. Uh, so I ended up just forfeiting the deposit, not taking it. I was 
not going to try to bother speculating in the thing and trying to flip it. I know some people were trying to do that. And besides which, I think Tesla was kind of opposed to it. But the important point that I'm making here uh, with this story is that it seems like the demand is less than anticipated. Um, because the delivery dates that were provided to me, presumably, were basically just the queue of people who had pre-ordered it and people who had additionally put down a $1,000 deposit at some point last year the way I had done. And we're still deciding not to take delivery, which I think is kind of remarkable. You have something that people have been waiting for a long time. Um, you know, they put down whatever they did, you know, a thousand bucks plus the pre-order. I don't remember what the ordering fee was. It was probably only like a hundred dollars or something like that. Um, but they were willing to just walk away from it, uh, as I did. And so that just tells me that demand uh, might not be quite uh, what we thought it was going to be. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that demand for all Teslas is falling off just because the one that had the biggest waiting list at the moment um, and is being delivered. So I'm going to you know, keep the roadster out of it. It just seems like uh, maybe we're, we're leveling off on the EV side and some of the enthusiasm or, or bloom is off the rose, if you will. Okay, so I think I've got uh, options play up over here. So why don't we just take a quick peek at, uh, we'll go back to Carnival Cruise really quickly here. Um, so still, you know, this is, you know, well off of its all time highs. Uh, if you own the stock, I don't have any problem staying with it. Uh, I think we have a, a modest position in, in Carnival. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of things you could potentially do. You know, one of the things that can happen in a situation like this is that when you get this type of uncertainty um, coming into the equation, oftentimes you will get a bump up in the implied volatility uh, for the stock. Um, you know, people are concerned about something like this. In fact, that hasn't really happened um, so much here. Uh, we take a look at uh, front month volatility. Uh, it, it, it went up incrementally, um, but then net of their most recent 8K, it actually fell. That said, you know, to me, and I'm just going to talk about people who write calls for, for the sake of argument against stocks that they own. Uh, the thing that you most want to think about is, is the implied volatility, that's the price of options, is that implied volatility um, higher than what the stock has been realizing lately and what you expect it's going to realize. So the expectation about how volatile a stock is going to be in the future should be impacted by whether or not we see potential events uh, on the immediate horizon. So the most obvious of these, you know, obviously the event of the, of the bridge, there's no way to forecast that. But things that you can forecast would include things like earnings. And of course, we reported earnings uh, in the stock uh, this morning. So that event is behind us. This is the kind of circumstance where you are going to see options premiums fall pretty significantly. But if you're so inclined to write calls, now is actually a better time to do it, um, believe it or not. Even though the premiums are slightly lower, the volatility of a stock will actually tend to fall even further. So it can make more sense to write calls in an environment like this one against stock that you own. So if you own Carnival and you're thinking about doing something like that, um, you know, this is arguably a better time to do it uh, than going into an event like the one we just had. Even though the move in the stock price, as it turns out, was relatively modest, there are enough instances where the most important moves that a stock is going to make take place in and around events like that, that it's actually more uh, often a better idea to avoid them. So uh, just taking a look here, you could, uh, you know, for example, sell uh, relatively short dated, and that's what I prefer. So try to make sure that it's inside of these potential market moving catalysts and, you know, stay inside or things like uh, earnings. 18 calls, collect about 80 cents for those. Stock was about 17 bucks on the close, so yeah, it's actually closer to 17, 20. So you get 80 cents there, that's $1.60. Uh, $1.60 is your max possible gain if you sold that 
you know, sold that call against it, which um, I think is is fairly reasonable. Um, but if you don't own the stock, another possibility is cash covered puts, right? You could, uh, if you don't own the stock and you're trying to collect a little bit of premium here, uh, one of the things you could certainly think about is just uh, selling a downside put. And, you know, we'll just put the, uh, these things in here for now. So that's gonna be this. It's another way to get into the stock. Um, collecting almost a dollar. So you're looking at uh, collecting 5% plus of the stock price uh, for selling a downside put. And your, your break even is gonna be 1608. So, you know, that's a, the worst thing that happens to you is you, you get about, you know, better than 5% discount to today's closing stock price. So again, not, not a bad thing to consider once the catalyst has come and gone. And, and like I said, obviously it's unfortunate that uh, what happened in Baltimore, it's unfortunate that their, uh, their terminal there is affected, um, but they're not acting like that's gonna be a really uh, crucial thing. Okay. Um, with respect to Ford, I don't really have much to say on that one, except that um, it's not a stock I'm super crazy about. It used to be a long-term holder, just felt like they were struggling mightily to, uh, to execute. Okay, so moving on, I happen to be looking at this statistic today. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, we, we closed uh, today on the highs. Um, and so, you know, it just occurred to me that we have had a really extraordinary run here in the S&P since late October of last year. Um, we're up on a total return basis on the S&P 500. So if you happen to buy SPY, that's what we're looking at in this chart right now. So net of dividends and so on. We're up about 28%. And that doesn't happen very often, that over a comparable period of time, uh, you get that kind of rally. And take a look at the kind of rally it's been too. Um, very, very low volatility, just very steady, lower left to upper right kind of price action. And as I looked at that, one of the things that occurred to me straight away was you know, that actually looks like a steeper price appreciation for the S&P recently than we had off of the pandemic lows, if you could imagine. So let's go back and take a look at that for a second. Um, so this rate of appreciation is significantly greater than this rate of appreciation. And that is a circumstance where you are coming off the pandemic plunge, right? So the market basically does one of these things, it goes straight down, and then it, you know, we get a V-shaped bottom right there uh, in late March, and then you get, you know, this fairly phenomenal performance since. And let's just take a look at this. I'm going to draw a couple lines in here. I think this is kind of interesting. Um, so, that essentially represents the rate of appreciation coming off the pandemic plunge. And we're just going to look at the slope of that line versus a similar one for the period in which we find ourselves today. And as we can see, the rate of appreciation that we've got now is considerably faster. Okay, so let's give some thought to this. I went back and I looked at data going back to 1927 and the appreciation in the S&P that we have seen since October 27th through the end of today is above the 98th percentile. Less than 2% of the time have we seen this type of price appreciation. And so to me, it, it feels like we've had quite a run. Um, and so for those who might be so inclined thinking about hedging, you know, give it some consideration. Anyway, uh, I like emerging markets better for this reason, just uh, on a valuation basis, you could use something like uh, EEM. EEM happens to capture stuff like 
uh, China and so on. You know, some of the largest constituents are going to be in that area. So if you, you could, you know, we've got Taiwan Semi, which is obviously moving some of their operations stateside, but you've got a couple uh, Chinese things in there. So if you want to avoid that, you could also consider uh, something like uh, INDA, which is if you're in the emerging market space. That's the uh, India MSCI uh, index ETF. Okay. With that, let's see if uh, there are any questions. And if there are any, I will uh, try to answer them. So let me see if I can take a peek at what we have here. Uh, okay. Let's see what we've got. Okay, let's start with this one. I bought Halliburton at 34. It is now 39. I have an April 12, 36 covered call on it. Earnings are April 23rd. Should I let myself get called away uh, and take a profit or roll into earnings and take advantage of high implied volatility? Okay, this is really a great question. Um, and it is uh, a great question. This is actually the issue that I was just talking about a second ago, which is that you know selling covered calls against stocks that you own, perfectly good strategy to be sure. Um, it can be tempting to sell covered calls going into earnings because the implied volatility can be higher. And so the question then becomes, is it high enough? Well, I think I have on my screen right now a chart we can take a look at. And this is, you know, it might be hard for you guys to make out. So I'm, let me get rid of the lower part here for a second. I'm just going to get rid of this spread for a second. So what we're looking at here, what is this? I mean, it just looks like a, a big convoluted mess, I'm sure. The white represents three-month implied volatility. I should probably shorten that up a bit. Um, so depending on the covered calls that you're selling, let's actually even go even shorter than that. Okay. So that's one month uh, implied volatility in white. So that, think of that as the price of options that you're selling. That's, that's the premium relatively. One of the things that we can observe immediately, just going back the last two years, is that options premiums have just been falling generally. So it's obviously lumpy, but the trend is clearly going lower. Um, so just something to think about. We can also see that realized volatility is falling. But notice something else. The more important thing, and maybe we can blow this chart up a little bit so we can get a closer look at it, is that when you sell options premiums, you're selling the white line effectively. And whether or not you sold it at a good price is going to be represented by the orange line. So the white line is the implied volatility. The orange line represents the realized volatility. And one of the things you see, which I think is quite interesting, is that to the extent that selling covered calls turned out not to be a good idea, that occurred more frequently around these events. I, I don't have them labeled here, but take my word for it. What we're dealing with here, this bump, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, all of these big bumps that you're seeing, those are almost always the earnings events. And you can see that they're happening with some consistency here. Um, so, selling calls going into earnings. The reason you would do that is because you've identified a price at which you would have been happy to sell the stock anyway, particularly net of the premium that you get. The logic here being that um, coming out of earnings, the stock can do one of two things, it, three really. I mean, it could trade sideways, that's one possibility, or it could go higher or it could go lower. And if you're hoping you could sell it at the strike plus the premium, and if you can't, you'd rather just collect the premium, then it's fine. But what I am telling you that this chart represents is an indication that um, options are not overpriced going into earnings in the general case. So that's one of the reasons why if it's a stock you really like to own and want to own for the long term, um, that's a circumstance where I usually favor selling covered calls against it between those types of events. Okay. Uh, let's see what we got here. Hi, if you were going to, oh, this is a good one. 
If you were going to hedge SPY through June, what would your approach be using options? SPY 30 delta puts would be my answer. They're just cheap right now. I mean, I usually really like uh, trading put spreads. Um, we can just pull pull an example up here in, uh, in SPY in, in options play and just have a quick peek. So normally the reason that I like to, to buy put spreads is because there is, generally speaking, a volatility risk premium in options in the general case, often even more so in, e in ETF or index products. What I mean by that is people who sell options expect to get a premium for taking the risk of selling insurance to somebody else. But lately, it seems to me that uh, the implied volatility, the premium in many of these options, just isn't that high. Um, so you don't need to mitigate it that much. Let's just compare two trades and we'll see kind of what the potential benefit is. So uh, one thing you could do is you could say, uh, and I'm just going to, so it automatically chooses a put spread. I'm just going to choose bearish over here. And let's take a look at this one. All right. So you're interested to the end of June. So this is the June ending options. Uh, SPY closed 523. You're talking about hedging. So it's not as if you need to um, get something immediately at the money. Presumably, this is a hedge against your portfolio. Um, and by the way, to think, the way to think about this is that every contract represents 100 shares. It's about 500, we're gonna keep the math simple. It's about 500 bucks a share, so that's $50,000 worth notionally. If your portfolio behaves generally like the S&P, uh, for every 50,000 you hold, you could trade uh, one options contract as a hedge. Uh, so let's just ditch, the, um, ditch this for a second. Now, as you can see, uh, you know, in terms of a score, doesn't look all that uh, great. And the reason is because the market isn't in an uptrend the probability of profit just buying puts on, on an index is not all that high. One other quick point, just take a look at the price chart in this thing too. I mean, steady as she goes, right? Um, and there are circumstances similar to the one we're in. I noticed, for example, that the last time, excluding things like the pandemic, excluding things um, like the crash in 87, those kinds of real disaster situations. The last time we had a market that behaved about like this um, was March of 1999, actually. Um, so not a huge sample when we're dealing with that. That's the whole post-war era, post-World War II I'm talking about. Um, but in any case, so you buy this put and you're risking $464, $4.64 a share. That's less than 1% of the value of the underlying to buy that put. You could sell a lower strike put if you wanted to, that would lower the cost. Um, but the thing is, if you do that, and by the way, I would probably choose, you know, something like a 30 delta put. So let's just see which delta this is. This is 20, so I might actually go up a little bit. Uh, you can see the delta over here on the right. Nice round number, and this is close enough. Choose a 510. So $6.47 per share against the closing price of around 523. So that hedge is going to cost you one and a quarter percent. And it's interesting, by the way, that you chose the end of the month. Um, I kind of like that personally, and the reason is because, you know, the regular way expiration, you know, you're usually two weeks outside of a PCE announcement, which is something the Fed really cares about, and I care about that when it comes to hedging. So uh, I think that uh, is... Uh, any thoughts on Australian coal? Um, okay, you're, this is from Barry uh, Krofcheck. Uh I don't know whether this is in reference to uh, the Baltimore port situation. Uh, it might be. Uh, the reason I'm speculating it might be is because Australia is a big coal exporter. Um, that might be where that question is coming from. Russia is a big coal exporter. We do export coal and we do export coal through the Baltimore port. Um, Actually, we might have a chart of coal exports by country, I think. Um, 
So I'm going to ask producer Jay if he happens to see that uh, someplace, because I happen to be looking at that earlier. I didn't comment about it uh, so far. But one of the interesting observations I would make, make about that is that while it is, it's true that it's going to impact our coal exports, it is, you know, we're not a huge coal exporter relative to those other places. So um, a benefit, look, uh, anytime you create a supply constraint, a marginal supply constraint, that's good for producers that don't have that constraint. So if that's what this is in reference to, uh, I, I assume it's good for Australian coal. Um, okay. Let's see what else here. Uh, oh, this is, hey Mike, Nike closed last Thursday at 100 bucks and after hours had earnings, price went up to 104. Who is able to trade after hours and push up the price because it sold off the next morning? Uh, well, the, I, I guess every, well, I don't know, maybe your broker doesn't allow you to. I think pretty much every broker platform allows you to. Um, the quick point I would make, and I don't know, you didn't specify what brokerage platform you're using. Most retail brokerage platforms as opposed to the institutional ones, actually have uh, sort of a circuit breaker that they put in place so that you don't just accidentally fire orders in outside of regular market orders uh, hours. And that is because the price could be meaningfully away uh, from where it uh, traded during the regular session and a bid ask spread might be extremely wide. So there's additional risk because liquidity is, you know, has dried up quite considerably. So probably most of you watching are indeed able to trade the stock after hours or before the market. But I'm guessing that when you go into your brokerage platform, you actually have to specify that. Usually you might have something that says day uh, GTC and so like that, you know, a day order, good till canceled. And usually uh, it's going to be in that area that you're going to say, you know, is it restricted to real, you know, to regular hours only overnight? after hours, pre-market and stuff like that, you have to specify. And that's just basically an extra risk check that the brokers will implement. So I assume that um, pretty much anybody um, who has a self-directed brokerage platform is probably able to trade after hours. I'm not saying it's a good thing to do. Uh, actually, at the first trading firm I worked at, uh, which was a firm called Gateway Partners, uh, we, we banned it. You know, This is all professional prop traders, but we didn't seem to be any better at masterminding where that stock should be um, than, you know, than anyone else normally would be. Uh, the people who are likely to move it around, I'm not sure what they're up to, but you can see many times they get it, get it wrong. So uh, the principal reason to trade after hours is if you have an options position and you have real profits. So let's say, for example, you, you uh, had Nike calls and you saw that the stock traded up after hours, now they're in the money and you're thinking, boy, I'd really like to lock in some of those gains. Options cannot trade after hours. In that circumstance, you could sell some stock against your long calls um, and thus lock in some or all of your profits if you wanted to. And actually just sort of trade the gamma. So if it goes up, you can sell some stock. If it comes back in, you could buy it back again and so on. Um, so that, that would be a reason to trade after hours. Otherwise, it's not something I encourage people to do uh, all that often. Uh, okay. Is there any way, time of day, VWAP, to know when to get into a position so as not to be subject to the manipulation of the stock price by, quote, big money, unquote? So, um, we, talk, we often talk about, you'll, you'll, Carter will talk about this. Uh, I, I mention it um, from time to time. I don't refer to it as big money. We refer to it as uh, what we call real money accounts. Who are the real money accounts? Real money accounts are large institutional asset managers. So mutual funds would be a good example. I'm talking about Fidelity, I'm talking about Putnam, I'm talking about Wellington, uh, outfits like that. Now they, real money accounts move stock prices. They do not manipulate them though. 
Um, because generally speaking, when they're moving stock prices, they're moving the price away from what they want. It's just by virtue of their size. So, um, you know, we, I think we had uh, somebody talking about Halliburton earlier. And so you could just say, okay, well, who's the largest holder of, of Halliburton? And yeah, you know, Vanguard is right up there, but Vanguard is a little bit different. It's mostly indexing and, and you also have some sort of steady eddy accounts. But if you, you'll see things like T. Row in here. Um, so mutual fund companies like that. And they uh, hold 42 million shares. And they recently bought 5.6 million shares of stock. We can kind of see the growth in their uh, positions over time in a, in a chart here. And that kind of uh, situation, it's just not that easy for them to... They're moving blocks that are just too big. They, they're not gaming the system. They don't have any mechanism to do it. It takes too long to trade into, um, into and out of really big positions for them to manipulate the stock. It's for this reason that dark pools were invented. They're more concerned about people manipulating the markets because they know that they're coming in behind. So in other words, if a real money account is a known buyer, people who are Purchasing small amounts can buy a small amount of stock knowing that they're stopped out by a big buyer behind them. Um, and so they're more likely to be subject to manipulation um, than actually doing it, even though they move the price. So um, I don't worry about that so much. I think the best thing you can do, you know, VWAP is just a backward looking indicator uh, what I'm more interested in than anything is probably the short-term technicals. Uh, if you're trading intraday, uh, I happen to look at candles pretty frequently, three, five minutes, uh, things like that. I just want to see whether people are buying, you know, whether they're lifting the offer or hitting the bid. That kind of thing is, is helpful. But admittedly, uh, it's not something I spend a huge amount of time uh, concerning myself with. Okay. Um, where? Okay. Where can we send questions after this episode is completed? Usually after the second listen, I have some questions. Second listen. You can stand to listen to this more than once. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, very flattering. Or maybe you're just uh, busy writing down complaints. Uh, just put comments into the YouTube channel, I think. Uh, the live chat, of course, is going to go away. But you can put comments in, and I do look at those when I get a chance. Um, so I think that's... Uh, Okay, for your CNBC trade, you gave to buy 130, 500 or the, oh, the Jan 2025 500 put for insurance against a market correction. Okay, so um, hoping I shared this. When was that? I think we were talking about this um, last week. Basically the same thing I was just talking about here. You know, index options are very, very cheap right here and now. Um, and I think it definitely gives folks a little bit of um, you know, sleep at night stuff. Look, markets up 27% since October 27th. Um, is it such a bad idea when insurance is as cheap as, na as it is right now to buy a little bit of downside protection and, and give yourself some time? I was looking at the January 25. You could buy protection. It was like 3% out to January 25. So, um, you know, I think you can, uh, you know, do that. But I was looking at the 500 strike because I was looking for about 30 delta. I think that's what it was at the time. Um, but do as it suits you. Uh, get it a little closer to at the money, you get more immediate protection, but you're gonna pay more. My own sense of it is that you, it's a hedge. It's you know, you're not making a bearish bet. So you don't need to set those strikes too tight. You know, just throw a small amount of premium, give yourself some time, lean into that so that you can stay in your long stocks. Mike, how do you manage spreads with eye on deltas and time? Um, this is also a very good question. I'm not 100% sure whether you are referring to the fact that the delta of an option changes through time. That sensitivity is sometimes called charm. It's a, you know, it's a tertiary Greek. Um, or I guess a secondary Greek. So when we're talking about the Greeks, when we talk about options, we are talking about 
rates of change. So I, the first derivative with respect to price is delta. Delta is the rate of change in the price of an option as the price of the underlying stock goes up and down. So, and it's basically, you can think of it as a percentage. Um, so imagine that you have a hundred dollar stock, it goes up a dollar or down a dollar. How much does the option rise or fall? Well, if it's a 50 delta option for that $1 increase in the stock price, the um, option, if it's a call option 50 delta is gonna go up 50 cents, $2, it'll go up one dollar, fifty percent of the rate. Of course, all of these rates of change have rates of change of their own with respect to other factors. So the delta of an option can change as the stock price moves dramatically. So that's the second derivative. We're getting a little wonky. That's called gamma. But it can also change with respect to time. Um, as time passes, the delta of an option will change as well. Uh, some people refer to that as um, charm. I mean, I think a lot of options traders have their own sort of way to, to talk about it. Uh, the delta of an option can also change with respect to changes in implied volatility. Actually, and I think this is just an important point generally, is something to think about, is that the impact of time on the value of an option is very, very similar to the impact of um, the changes in implied volatility. So if you think about how the value of an option changes all of its characteristics, the longer it has to expiration, so its gamma goes down and its delta tr trends towards 50, uh, the same is true if the vega goes way up. So the longer out in time or the larger the implied uh, volatility, did I just say vega goes up? Vega is the sensitivity with respect to fall, but um, the higher your implied vol is, the further out in time, those impacts on a value of an option are very similar in, in many respects. Um, so the way I think about deltas and time, and this I think is especially important if you have options that are gonna expire one week, two weeks, three weeks out, is I look at what the deltas of the position will be on a standstill basis on the expiration date, because I know it's gonna migrate to that. So if, and I actually refer to this all the time, I'll talk to other traders, I'll say, you know, I think about hard deltas and soft deltas, um, but I'm just thinking about how um, that position is going to look on expiration. So really good example, if I am short and a slightly in the money cash covered put and it's going to expire, well, we have expiration tomorrow because Friday's off, good Friday. Um, maybe that thing's 60 Delta right now. What is it tomorrow? It's 100, right? So um, I know that if I'm managing the whole book and I'm thinking about my notional deltas at the top line, some of these things are going to move around a lot just as a function of time. So uh, I like to advance the clock and, and then work my way back. So that's one way to think about that. I think we're really chewing up the clock here, getting close to five. I don't want to keep you guys for too, too long. Um, let me see if there's something else of interest we can hit really quickly. Um, let's see here. Well, that's very flattering. Coco beware. Yeah, that's my guy Adami nickname for me. <laughs> uh, I miss options action too, but um, we could, you know, it's something we couldn't do. We couldn't interact with people on options action. This is much nicer. I always wanted us to take questions. We did once or twice. We had one of the Baldwin brothers on the show in the early days, and we had um, the producer got Henry Hill on. Um, the, the gangster that was the inspiration for the movie Goodfellas. He actually, I don't know how the producer got in touch with him, but we actually got a phone call from uh, Henry Hill. He died shortly thereafter. I think he was in his late 60s. But um, I like the fact that we can interact with people. Um, so enjoy the content with Options Play. What is your thought on shorting Apple below 170? You know, uh, who sent this? So this is interesting. Um, It's a ways off before we get their numbers, but a lot of people are, are concerned about China with Apple and what their numbers are actually gonna look like. So people who are looking up are looking at iOS 18, but people who are looking down are concerned about what's going on over there. Um, and you got this DOG, DOJ thing going on. 
I'm not, I'm just not a huge fan of Apple right here. I mean, they obviously have had phenomenal EPS growth over time, great free cash flow. That EPS growth, though, is not a function of top line growth, it is a function of buybacks. And that's great, but it, you know, it only goes so far. You want to have, you want to be invested in growing businesses. And, um, and this one seems to have leveled off a little bit. It's not hugely expensive. So, you know, those of you who have had held it for long periods of time, you know, I'm not saying the stock's going to go down tomorrow. I think China's a risk, though. Um, so with that said, and also because it's a low volatility name, um, you know, I'd be perfectly happy to, um, you know, maybe to buy some put spreads uh, on it ahead of earnings thinking about the potential for some negative news to come out of the China side. I think that that makes some sense. You know, an important thing about these big stocks, too, that I, that is important, and that is that for there are index funds. SPY is an index fund. Vanguard has an index fund. There is a natural flow. Every couple of weeks, people get a paycheck. 401k money comes out. It goes in. Where does it go? A lot of it goes into equities. It, more of that money flows into the larger cap equities. It is a functional relationship. It's not, um, so just know that there's always sort of a steady flow of investment capital going into uh, these things through those types of investments. So uh, that does create some support for it along with the tremendous free cash flow that you see. But of course, you know, stocks can and do fall out of favor. And, um, you know, that could well be the case for Apple uh, as well. Uh, I don't own, I don't own Apple myself. Um, thank you guys all. We've uh, chewed up another 45 minutes of your day. Uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in and, and giving this a listen. Like, subscribe, and as that other person was saying, send your comments and questions in, in the YouTube uh, comment section because the live chat's gonna go away after. Uh, and we'll take a look at them and, you know, Hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, you know, to address those in a future episode, and we will have one of those next week on Monday at 4:15. Uh, enjoy the Easter weekend. Thank you for watching.